Today we're going to sit down with David Earle and Chris Hayward from Focus Features upcoming title Brian and Charles. The film follows Brian, played by David Earle, a lonely inventor in rural Wales who spends his days building quirky, unconventional contraptions that seldom work. Undeterred by his lack of success, Brian attempts his biggest project yet. Three days, a washing machine, and various spare parts later, he invents Charles, played by Chris Hayward, an artificial intelligent robot who learns English from a dictionary and has an obsession with cabbages. What follows is a humorous and entirely heartwarming story about friendship, family, finding love, and letting go. You know our mission here. It's putting a spotlight on extraordinarily beautiful stories with phenomenal performances. Brian and Charles achieves this with such ease. It's a charming story that tackles complex themes in a way that leaves audiences filled with joy and hope. Okay, why don't we just jump right on in? Gents, how are you all doing today? Good, thank you. How are yeah, you? Good. good, I'm doing well. Uh, where, where are you in the world right now? I'm in southwest England uh, in a county called Devon. Okay. Yeah. And I'm in London. Okay. <laughs> Look at that. And uh, one of the questions I had after watching this movie was the was really how long have you known each other? How long have you been friends and colleagues? Um, definitely over ten years. Um, is that right, David? Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember. I first saw David performing uh, as Brian Gittins. So I met him at a comedy show, and um, at the time we lived near each other as well. Um, so yeah, we started hanging out a bit and but yeah, I think it was about 10 or maybe longer, like 12 years, maybe it seems like only yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what was that vibe? I mean, did you immediately have this have some chemistry? Did it that take time to develop or did you guys hit it off famously? I remember thinking David was quite shy at first. I thought, oh, I might scare him off. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I was like, oh, he's quite sort of, and also he's very different. His persona as, as Brian Kittens is very different to what he, who, who he actually is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, steady. Um, in a nice way. Right. Uh, I like I like Chris's quirky, funny brain. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so Dwayne, I, think, I guess Dwayne, was, Dwayne, uh, I really yes. like your, I really like your top. By the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Genuinely. I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. It's very comfortable. First and for, first and foremost, it's very <laughs> <Yeah>. soft <laughs> and comfortable. <laughs> Podcasting. Yeah. Uh, but I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's all right. That's all right. Um, yeah. So that's, what, that's why I like David. He's he would always compliment me on things and <laughs> just <told> me, <laughs> set me at ease. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get it. I, I'm here for it, and so I'm gonna just insert myself right into the squad because I mean yeah. I'm here for the compliments. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love. I mean, as I as I watch this movie, I mean, and first, I mean, bravo. I've this is truly such a beautiful, magical film that every time I watch it twice, every time I watched it, I took a little bit more away from it. And uh, it, it really sat in my soul for like the last 24 hours. And I'm like, how'd they pull this off? Because it's actually a very complicated movie to pull off in, in the style in which you did it. And so one, you know, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. And two, did you imagine like looking back, David, at this character you've created for at least, I mean, how long has you know, the character been around? 12, 13 years? Like 15 or something. Yeah, yeah. Did you yeah. imagine you'd be here and seeing it on the screen like this? No, no way, no way. Like, I've been doing it stand up for 10 years and, um, like, just had a, my fair share of terrible gigs. Because I used to, Brian, I used to perform as Brian, as a, and his role was um, a, a bad stand up comedian. So I'd go on stage to just, you know, make it a bit awkward and make people feel uneasy. And if it went down well, you know, it was really good, but I had some terrible nights. So along the way, I, no way when I was dying on my ass in London, did I think i will be making a film? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how we got here really. Yeah. I, that's one of the things I just kept looking. I mean, I read a bunch of interviews you've done, learned a little bit about the character and the background of it. And I learned about your collaboration and how it all came to be, especially with the short and all that. 
And I'm like, this movie's like, uh, it, it took everything to, everything had to line up perfectly. And I have to imagine as seeing, I've worked in the studio system. I've made a lot of independent films. I mean, this just came together like magic. And like, I'm like, man, cause there's a lot, I mean, just from like production design. And I mean, if you took away just your performances and acting, you just like the production design and all the things that had to line up, line up to actually achieve that looks on this on screen. Uh, you have to be very proud. Like the day after we finished shooting, Wales went into lockdown. So we had just wrapped the film and then, oh, like 24 hours later, we would have had to stop anyway. It's just, yeah, bizarre. Yeah. Just lined up. Sometimes yeah. the magic, that it's, that's magic, right? Everything kind of lines up perfectly. Yeah. So you did the short and I haven't seen the short. Is, is the short, is there a, a component of it in the film or is it just completely adapted as, a, as it's a new, piece, a new piece? Yeah, it's different to the film. We just wanted to make a little self-contained story. Um, I think the characters are slightly different as well. Brian's probably, someone said recently, oh, Brian's, he's a bit meaner in the short and his attitude towards Charles is a bit meaner. But um, in terms of the, the setting and the tone, we were trying to, to emulate that. And whenever we got lost with the story and trying to work it out, we'd always refer back to the short and uh, what, we want, what we liked about that, that we wanted to keep. When you go from making the short and having the conversations and turning this into a feature, how much time did it take from that, from getting the, you know, the green light in a sense to make this feature to first day of production? Is that like two years, three years? We were ready to go. We were we were going to shoot March two thousand and twenty, weren't we? Yeah. And so we, I think, we had a script commission for film for it was really quick. I think it was like the end of two thousand seventeen. So we we wrote it for eighteen months or two years, eighteen months. And so we were going to film March two thousand twenty, and then a week later went into lockdown. COVID hit, and um, yeah, so. Then it was delayed by eight months. We never we thought our film would be the first one that would get shelved and never get made. So, but it, it feels like a really quick from the commission to you know ready to go on set it was, wasn't long at all. Had you had you written a feature length script before? No, God no. How was <laughs> how how'd that feel? Uh, get jumping into that and formatting and knocking that script out. Oh man, just. Yeah, I'll say I, I couldn't, when we first started, I couldn't imagine like getting, keeping someone interested for 90 minutes just seems like such a lot. The amount of films I turn off after 10 minutes, it's like, oh God, oh God, we've got to do that. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's crazy you know, though. That was, the hardest, that was the hardest part was working out a plot that would sustain people's interest. And also because it's quite weird, uh, we were always worried that people were going to think oh this is too bizarre and switch off and so it was, a, it was a balancing act of getting the uh the emotional part of it there while also keeping the the weirder elements yeah just just a long time to your credit like you know uh, the, the the balance that you keep where it never tips past the point of feeling surreal or feeling something like you keep the audience engaged this entire movie and I honestly thought, like, when it ended, I'm like, that went by so quickly. And I'm like, is that movie, like, 60 minutes? And I'm like, wow, it's 90. Like, it felt very short. And I just felt like I was, uh, you really took care of the audience. You took care of the viewer in a way that I felt was really respectful. Uh, so, again, incredible work on that. When you look back at the, the film and you remember writing the script and putting together that, that initial draft, do you, was there a lot that didn't make it into the movie? There's a lot of improv that took place. How much, how much, I can only imagine with your backgrounds, what it was actually like to actually make the film. Yeah, well, we had a, uh, we did have another a plot strand in there as well that we were trying to, I think our first draft was a bit more complicated and we had a bit too much in there almost. So we had to strip it down and we had a good note actually from film four that was saying, always, con always remember this, this is about Brian and Charles. So whenever we we had some scenes that had uh, the the bad guy Eddie, there was more involving him. But whenever we went down that road, it seemed to take attention away from Brian Charles. So it's almost yeah, it's almost like sculpting. Like just 
you put all, everything in there to begin with and then you kind of just finally chop it away until you've got something a bit more streamlined. I think that's how we ended up doing it. But and there was also a lot of trial and error, just thinking what does what felt what felt right and what felt there had to go. Yeah. David, when you when you when you jump into production on this, what was your main goal with Brian? What was that what you were trying to achieve? My main one was to get through this filming without getting ill. I just I thought I'd get a cold or get the sniffles or something. You lost your voice at one point, didn't you? I lost my voice. Yeah, there's a couple of scenes in there. I'm, oh, I'm talking a bit like that. <laughs> but, I, you know, I was so nervous about uh, taking on the role just because I'm, I'm in nearly every scene for 90 minutes. I thought, God, if you don't like me or the character, you're going to hate this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so was, I was just really worried about taking it on because I've never done anything like that before, especially over 90 minutes anyway. Um, but, you know, working with Jim and like Chris and Rupert, that were all friends, it was, yeah, a lot, a lot easier. Incredible. Yeah. And Chris, with Charles, what was your goal? What was what you were trying to achieve in this? Uh, first of all, I, wanted, I, I was worried that people weren't going to believe Charles as a character, that they would see it as me, as a man in a, in a box. And I think when we made the shorts, there were a couple of shots where it's quite clearly my sort of legs i mean obviously even in the feature you can kind of you know you can see it's a person in the costume but um yeah that was my initial concern was are people gonna see that as a separate character and not see it as a as a prop um i think on the first day we heard some of the crew members talking to charles as if he was real people would say i could hear people saying oh look at charles and kind of referring to him as a an individual so thought, okay, we might be able to get away with it. <laughs> you absolutely got away with it. Uh, what are some challenges you didn't anticipate while making this movie? Uh, how damp Wales was for me. How damp and drizzly and... It was damp for four yeah, weeks. My feet, were hot. my feet were freezing for the entire <laughs> shoe. Wow. I, and his, the, 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 uh, the shoes that I was wearing as Charles just let the water in all the time. <laughs> so... They had to pack sort of these uh, heat packs into my feet, into my shoes to try and warm my feet up. But um, we'd have the days sellotape on our kitchen wall, wouldn't we? Of the scenes we'd have to do each day. Yeah, we we all stayed together in the same flat, and we would go, "Oh my god, we've got to do that today." There was some. Um, I mean, for the most part, stick it off, and yeah. For the most part, it was. Um, it was good fun for me. The hardest bit was um, there's a scene where I'm in the back of a truck and the weather was so terrible. It was just torrential rain. I'm dressed as Charles. I'm facing the wrong way. Uh, I can't see anything. So I'm getting motion sickness because I, I can't see where this truck's going. It was about I was 2 to, yeah. It's 2 AM. I was having to shout the lines of dialogue at David so he could hear them because we're driving about, you know, 20 miles an hour or something. And I just thought, it's in the middle of winter in Wales. I'm dressed as a robot, and it's during a global pandemic. <laughs> it's the maddest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, it just seemed like, uh, I have to imagine you enjoy, I mean, it sounds wet and cold, but looking back, it sounds like you all enjoyed it. It sounded like it was, it was quite oh, a yeah. special event. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and what, what's interesting is that you took it, you took a unique approach to it. So like your creators, your actors, I'm sure you're involved with like creative decision-making on set. How are you able to jump in and out of being a character? And then, you know, as a producer, how was that? Or as a creator, how did you manage that? Did you find that tricky at all? No, weirdly, because I've been doing Brian for ages or sort of, sort of versions of him. I, I just don't, as soon as I put the glasses on and, just just a way of it. it's really weird so no i mean what i did find hard is just like i said this i was in virtually every scene so it'd just be right change costume into that one into that one it was so so quick um 
but yeah, but with regards to coming out of character and in character, no, I was, I was okay. Yeah. How how quick can you get into care? I mean, is it something that you're like you're just naturally in and out of? It would be really easy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thought he's good. <laughs> Not here. <he's> good. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So quick. <laughs> yeah. Very really quick. That's amazing. That's actually incredible. Um, what what advice if you could have gone back to yourself a year before making this movie? What advice would you have given yourself in preparation that you didn't anticipate? Something that you're like, you know what? This is going to be okay. This is going to be tricky. What would you go back and tell yourself? Um, not worry so much. And yeah, I don't know. Not worry so much. Prepare, let go, just have fun and, and embrace the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, not worry so much. How do you do that? How do you not worry so much? Yeah. <laughs> We're shifting yeah. the podcast and focusing strictly on how to worry less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that. How about you, Chris? Yeah, I'm in the same. I think just sort of um, relax. The problem is because of the, the pandemic, that was always hovering over us. So even when we were filming it, there was an anxiety of, uh, you know, what we could get. This could get pulled at any moment. Oh, All the yeah. rules could change. Um, and like like we said, the Wales got um, went into their whatever it was called fire break lockdown the day after we filmed. So that was always a kind of threat over our heads. So it was more, even when we finished filming, it was more like relief to be going, oh, wow, we actually, we actually got it done. Yeah. And um, yeah, because even during filming, there were, we were worried that someone was going to test positive for, for COVID or, you know, there are all these things that could change. So uh, it was a, an extra element of difficulty that we had to juggle. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, <laughs> it was a very complex time. Um, on the on the on a more positive note, when you look back, what is something? Maybe it's something you see when you watch the movie, or something. It's just a memory that you have. What's one of your favorite moments about making this film? Like it's like a specific moment in time. I remember with the um, <clears throat> the scene where I'm where we're all together in the in the yard and I'm dancing, and um, in front of Eddie, I remember just really enjoying that because it was just, I could just go mad with the dancing, and I was mainly trying to see if I could make people laugh. And so that was just really enjoyable. I could hear sort of people laughing and stuff. So, and 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 also how we imagined that scene, it came out exactly how how we imagined it with the tension between those two, and the the weather was perfect. So yeah, I'm really happy with that scene. Yeah, same with me actually. That's my favourite scene because of the tension there, and I'm I'm supposed to be fearing Eddie and taking it all very seriously. So having Chris next to me doing the Irish jig it was just yeah, and everyone's there like Hazel and Eddie and the the twins. Yeah, um, everyone's involved. Yeah, that's it's such a beautiful scene. Um, location, I mean, we talked about the location quite a bit. It's a character in the movie, right? So, how, how did you decide on where to film this? <clears throat> well, we shot the short film um, in the similar and nearby, not too far away actually, which is uh, Snowdonia in Wales. And um, it just had such amazing scenery that we, um, yeah, decided to set it in a similar area for the for the feature because it has it has like a real character to it. And there are some shots um, that are uh, amazing shots that makes it look a bit like the Wild West. Some of the trees, uh, yeah, remind me of the kind of bleak Wild West sort of landscape. Um, it took Jim. Jim doing the wreck. I don't know if he did it with Rupert, but it took him a while to find that cottage, knocking on a lot of doors, or, or maybe the location manager. Um, but yeah, uh, but we sort of really struck gold when we we got it because we didn't have to change a lot. Because in, inside Brian's workshop, it was all there, just leads and pipes and tools. Yeah. And, it was yeah. already really, uh, wow. really clever and it just looked incredible. So all we had to do was chuck in a cuckoo clock and we were good to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's incredible. Did uh, did you, had you spent time, do you spend time in Wales regularly? Well, I grew up not too far from Wales. So, um, yeah, we'd have a lot of weekend trips there and I, I, I grew up on the border, so I, I knew it pretty well. And um, yeah, because it has a bit of a fairy tale quality to it, the film. 
and just some of that scenery is uh, kind of fairy ish so it just felt perfect for it. A hundred percent. It's I mean it's it's so perfect. It's absolutely perfect, and every little detail in there. Again, think about the production design and art department, and even in the wardrobe. Like every little detail, I would pause. I'd pause the movie and just look at everything in the room, on the characters. Every every single scene throughout this movie is so well curated. Yeah. Uh, incredible intention is there was there a did you spend a lot of time on a like a, a character bible and like just the, the background of this sort of stuff or did that something all happen naturally well we just had a really great uh, production department and um a wardrobe department who just came up with so many brilliant ideas we were sort of spoiled for choice really as to what we could what we could go with and i think they also they had a lot of fun as well especially with the inventions we would give them a list of ideas and then it was just really good fun seeing what they had, what they had come up with. Yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed that part of it. Well, as well, I, mean, I was thinking about that while I was watching. Was the inventions alone like had to spend you had to spend a lot of time coming up with ideas for the inventions? I mean, that had to have been like an entire year of just brainstorming inventions, right? Or did, were those something things that you know, David, over time that you had already kind of curated? Well, uh, we we had some inventions in the in the script, like the egg belt and whatever. Um, but on the day, I hadn't seen any of the inventions in that shed. So J- Jim wanted me to go in and react. Um, yeah, and capture my reaction for the first time. And, and, and then I'd have to tell the, tell Jim exactly what I was in- attempting to build. <laughs> <laughs> so in those moments, that was me trying to go, right, what the hell's this? Okay. Yeah. So a lot of those were surprises to me as well. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, I love the trolling shoes. I thought that was a wonderful little scene. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 When you look, uh, when you want, you imagine this movie, you know, coming here in North America, and you you have entirely new audience of, available to you. What are you hoping that when they watch this movie, that they they take away or they you know they sit with? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's brilliant that it seems to be going down well in America because. I think uh, sometimes it feels so British. You think, oh, is this going to translate overseas? Um, so, yeah, that's really positive. And I mean, I always just thought, well, I just want people to really have a good time with it and just really, if we can really make people laugh and have a good time, then that's that's enough for me. <laughs> Beautiful. David? Uh, yeah, same. I just, I want that. If people could have that warm feeling when they leave the cinema, I feel, all, uh, you know, yeah, that they just fall in love with the characters and yeah, to have, have a nice time. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I am very impressed with what you've created here. Do you anticipate you're going to, are you starting on another project? Are you working on another feature yet? Or is this something that you you're looking forward to doing again? Well, yeah, we're talking about some ideas at the moment, um, feature ideas. It just it was just so fun doing a film, and I've just really enjoyed the process of seeing it all come together. And uh, having been involved in, in sort of various uh, TV roles in, in like a small capacity, I find film just more more interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that probably means I'm never getting any TV work again now, but I just find it more of an interesting process. So we're, yeah, we're talking about various uh, other ideas and even, yeah, the, the idea of a sequel has been kicked around. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Same with you, David. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I do. Like, I hadn't really thought of movies before. And then now we've, we've written that and it's sort of all I'm thinking about now. I really like how they just exist in that 90-minute bubble and and you can watch it again and again with tv it's like you're not going to watch a tv series again no. it's just right whereas with film yeah you just come back to it and yeah i'd i'd love to do more yeah the format is just so perfect the time the amount of time that you have with the audience is i think the perfect amount of time i think that yeah. on set and when you're actually making it is the most fun and you you feel like you've created a, a whole family you know you show up to the first day of set and you're like oh some of these people i mean for the first time yeah. And then all of a sudden, like we get through this and we're family, we're all family now. And that's yeah. a special feeling. It is. And it's really sad when you say goodbye. Yeah. Like, oh, right. Bye. I thought you were my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please be my friend. 
Well, yeah. it's, a, it's always a good sign of a great project is where you have you you get to the end of it and you have, everyone feels that way and there's you know not a dry high eye in the production. Yeah, you know and it, and that's a good sign that you've made something special. And I think that's a, that feeling's addicting. You know, you're like, oh, yeah. yeah, it takes a lot out of you. It's exhausting, but at the same time, like you, you can't wait to do the next one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I have two last questions for you all, and they're a little bit off topic. One, uh, are you all football supporters? Yeah. Okay, what's your clubs? Well, I've just started. Well, I'm Man United, but I've just. Are you talking soccer? Yep. I've just started supporting Exeter, who are in League Two, but they've just been promoted, so they've gone into League One. So I'm bang it. I'm, I've got a season ticket. That's awesome. Yeah. How did you fall into that in, in, in that fandom? Because we're, I just moved down here, and I was like, I've never supporting Man United has always been like a five hour drive away, so I've never really gone to watch live football. So I thought, right, I want to go and watch my local team. I want to, I want it to be a ritual every Saturday. I, I drag the kids. I want to go on a boxing day and wear my Christmas jumper. I, <laughs> I love just, it. Yeah, it's, and I really loved it. Really loved it. Yeah, yeah. Chris, I'm more of an American football fan. No way. Yeah, I, I like the 49ers. I don't really um I watch the World Cup and that's when I watch football. And sometimes my my dad loves football, so I'll watch some matches with him. But um yeah, David's much more of a fan than I am. Wow, that's so funny. I, I would not have guessed that. I uh I, I grew up here but I spent a lot of time in Europe. My mother's Danish, so I lived in Copenhagen for quite some time. Oh. Well, was, yeah, so there's a lot of Danish players that go over the EPL and I you know, I'm a big Arsenal supporter mainly because of And my dad lived in Norway. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said the Danes are the loveliest people he's ever met. That's what he said. That's what he said. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Uh, yeah. My last question is comfort food. What is your, what is your comfort food? <laughs> when you're having a bad day and you're like, man, this is the only thing that's going to make everything feel better. What do you eat? Oh, I've got a terrible um, uh, sugar addiction. So anything, C- cakes, biscuits, some terrible so yeah. anything like that yeah yeah not anything but cabbage <laughs> yeah david i like cereal i really like cereal. <laughs> i love I that mean, a so nice bowl I, of I have cereal. like i have porridge <laughs> sprinkling of cornflakes <laughs> with, with some berries on top <laughs> a little bit of maple syrup yeah, it's just berries <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. That's fantastic. That's great. My nan used to put a lump of ice cream on top of that. <laughs> wow. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Does it matter yeah. what flavor ice cream or you just do you have a go to? Vanilla, because then it melts into the milk. It's really good. It's genuinely good. Yeah. What's yours? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, and no one's ever like bounced the question right back at me. Um Oh, that's you know, it's funny. The oatmeal is my I love just classic oatmeal. It's my go-to every yeah. single morning. It makes me feel nice and warm on the inside. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it used to be like mac and cheese. And then I, I start, you know, mm-hmm. then I ate too much mac and cheese during the pandemic. And I'm like, okay, can't do mac and cheese anymore. But yeah, I, I do like the warm. I like something warm that, I mean, I guess in a weird way that oatmeal and that mashed potato have, or mashed potatoes or uh, mac and cheese have that same consistency. Yeah. Uh, oh man. Now I'm, I'm getting hungry. Get to yeah. Now I'm going to get something to eat. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I Fine. this is genuinely. Where did you get your top from? So there's a little company in Los Angeles called Aviator Nation. Okay, looking yes. now, and they make uh, they're absolutely incredible. The founder of the company was obsessed with rock and roll T-shirts, and she didn't understand how, like in the 1970s, rock and roll T-shirts could last 40 years, and the new T-shirts don't. So she went and studied for like a year, and like they did the research to find the same materials. And the same machines that actually made all this classic 70s sweatshirts oh, wow. and t-shirts and yeah and then they app they she recreates them and they do like a limited run every season and they're extraordinary that's wow. <laughs> right i'm there now i'm there now <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah the lightning bolt well yeah I, I watch a lot of movies throughout the year and this is my top favorite this is my favorite movie i've watched in the last 24 months it is truly magical. It made me feel really warm on the inside. And I like movies that don't make me, like, make, make me feel that I'm not alone in the world. And this movie really connected with me in a, a really powerful way. 
all while laughing. I mean, like just chuckling the entire time and smiling ear to ear. Uh, and then it was so rad because like I said, I was able to then watch it again through more of a production lens. Like I watched it as a fan the first time. I watched through film filmmaker filmmaker lens and a production lens, and I was just like, "Man, this is truly extraordinary! Like, this is a wonderful film for every element of it. There's nothing that you all did wrong. Like, it was you just hit every single note for 90 minutes. So, congratulations, wow. and I'm excited That's for the world to see it. Thank you, really kind. All right, gentlemen, have a wonderful day. Enjoy your press day. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for listening in. Brian and Charles will be in theaters on Friday, June 17th. I encourage you to support these types of films, smaller, independent, artistic films that don't have massive budgets, but they have so much heart. Without these types of films, without supporting these types of filmmakers, actors, storytellers, and smaller studios, the world would be so fucking bland and homogenized. So yeah, let's uh, support those storytellers and studios that share such beautiful cinematic stories with us. And also, if you have a couple minutes, we'd really appreciate if you could leave us a rating and a review. Those two simple actions really help us in tremendous ways. Uh, So that's a wrap on this episode, kids. Thank you for supporting us and uh, love you mean it.